Hello. Uh, yeah, so I'm Alex Rose, and this is my talk, Stop Using Score, exclamation mark, aka no one wants to play your tower defense game in space. Right, so about me, uh, I'm a serial game jammer. I've been making jam, jam games for like five years now. I've done like every Ludum Dare for five years, a few global game jams and so on. I've won Ludum Dare as well. So uh, I've been making games for two decades. I've been making games since I was about four years old. Uh, and I'm kind of obsessive about watching players play my games. So when I go to, I do loads of shows every year. This is like just one of them, but like my booth's over there. And I, I sit and I watch everyone. Um, I, even for lunch, I bring a sandwich and then I'll eat it and I'll keep watching. Because I think the best thing you can do to improve your game is to sit and watch people. Because people give you feedback but if you're the developer, you can spot things that they would never notice. If you see 20 people make some small mistake, they might not tell you about it, but you'll see it. So you can, you can improve your game design a lot by just watching people. Uh, and I apparently know what I'm talking about, but you don't have to take my word for it. Yeah, that's just reviews for my game. So most games aren't fun. Right. They follow like rigid formulae, so they, they stick to a, a fixed formula. Often I see this from students of universities. They come out and they, they learn a certain way to make games rather than trying to be creative. And it isn't actually necessarily a problem. I think it is a good idea to follow a formula, it's just most people don't have the right formula. I think like Rami over there probably has a good formula for, for game design. Like Vlambeer, they know what to do with a the screen shake. They follow some kind of code, but they follow a good code. And universities don't teach a good code right now. Score sucks, right? Score is a thing that lots of people use and, and associate with games immediately, but it's a relic of arcade game design. It's simply there to take your money, right? There's, there's no actual... Okay, there is a point to it, but it's mo the point, the reason it was invented was to make you keep playing. So scoreboards existed, and they kept people playing and against each other over and over again. So if you notice that your score had disappeared off the leaderboard and someone beat you, that would be more motivation for you to play a game that you've already completed over and over again. And it keeps people playing and that makes you money. Right. But it encourages really stupid mundane behavior. So if you think about Mario, here's a Mario level, right? The, the whole point of the game is to go right. You start here, you've got to get here. But when you jump on a coin block, you're not actually making any progress whatsoever. It's not helping you. You're not progressing along the level. You're just making a number go up. So it's just pointless behavior. It encourages people to do things that don't matter. Right? And it measures how much time they sacrifice. It isn't measuring skill. It's not difficult to hit a coin block in Mario. It's just, it just takes your time. So there's alternatives. This is my game. Uh, so up here, you see this is the time at the, uh, at the top left. right? Time is actually a great method of scoring because it's a method of scoring which relies on skill. So the more times you, the quicker, the better you get at a game, the quicker you can beat a level. So you can still have a leaderboard where people have to beat each other, but now they're racing each other rather than just trying to make a point score go up. And also rank is pretty good. So you can make a player like get a gold medal or something or a silver medal, and then and then that rewards them in a more discreet way, where they feel like they've finished. So if someone, if you have a game with score and you give them an A rank, they have a way to complete the game and feel like they're done, but they can keep playing if they want. Uh, and another thing you can do is do <laughs> perfects, right? So, so my game has perfects in it, where um, every, every time in my game you die, your bodies stay behind, and you can jump on your bodies, right? So the game gets easier with each death, but you can beat the entire game without dying at all. So if you do that, you get a perfect. So I reward the player for, doing, for playing perfectly, and then they don't have to keep playing again, but it encourages them to just get that perfect score, and then, and then they've finished, and they, and they can move on with their lives. But also, I give them gold ranks if they do well, and then there is no silver, there's no bronze. Because I think, I think actually gold, silver, and bronze, if you get a bronze, it feels like you're bad at the game. It's kind of a punishment. Whereas in this game, it feels good that you complete it at all, but then if you do extra well, you get gold, and if you do extra, extra well, you get rainbow. So the, the, there are obvious exceptions to this, though, right? So rhythm games, actually, it is useful to use score there. And I'm going to go through these as I go on. 
I, I don't just criticize for no reason, but like ry rhythm games, if you think about it, each one is a level with a fixed number of points. You can only, there is a theoretical maximum number of points in each level. And it's the same for shoot 'em ups, where you've got like a ship that moves on the screen and the level has a certain time in it. So if, as long as you're doing that, because you can't rank them on time, you can rank them on score. Especially some rhythm games uh, notice how close to the center of the note you hit as well. So they notice how, how good your rhythm is. So do you know what else sucks? Fixed health. So this, is, this doesn't happen so much in AAA games anymore. Um, you, you shouldn't put an economy on your health. And you can see here, this is perfect dark. And this game was really punishing because the levels would be sometimes like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. And you have to get through that entire thing without dying. But if you get hit at the start, if you get shot once, that mistake carries with you forever. And humans are quite fallible. We make problems, especially when we're beginners. We make problems, we make like mistakes all the time. So if, if a player makes a very small mistake at the beginning, they might die 10 minutes later because of something that, that wasn't even really a big mistake on their part. And Perfect Dark had another big problem, which was if you played cooperatively, if you die, then your, your, co -op, your partner would take half your health. So if you're playing with your like, brother or something and your brother sucks at Perfect Dark, mine does, then uh, you, you can steal all their health. So it, it, it makes the game harder for both of you. And the worst thing is that the ultimate aim is to kill the player. So the whole point of giving people fixed health is they get punished for dying, right? Replaying your game is seen as a punishment. And I just, I, that, that doesn't gel with me as a design principle because people should want to play your game. It shouldn't be a chore. They shouldn't replay because they have to. They should replay because they want to. So alternatives, one hit deaths. And I know this seems counterintuitive because it's still killing them. But if you're gonna kill them, just do it. Design your whole game around it. So Meat Boy, you die all the time, but it doesn't matter because you only ever go back 20 seconds. If you, if you play Perfect Dark, you go back 10 minutes. If you play Meat Boy, you're only going back a very short amount of time. So the game is fair. And recharging health, that's a, a dumb jam game I made, where you're like a, a ninja bear with or whatever. But, the, but Halo, it kind of changed FPS forever. And you'll see this in Call of Duty and everything. They made it so that if you hide behind a pillar, then your health goes up. And some people don't like this, but Halo levels are about like an hour long sometimes, if you're playing a legendary. So, a mistake that you make at the beginning. You really wouldn't want to punish the player for problems they make in the beginning. So what, you do in, what they do instead is they heal you up, but only when you've got to a safe location. So it, it kind of like balances the game. Obviously, you, you can also just not use health at all. You can use your imagination. So if you think about it, you, the reason you're stopping people from using health, like the reason you're killing people, is to make them replay the level. So you're taking time off them. They lose time because they don't have enough skill. So you can just stun them, because it equally, if someone's stunned, it punishes them for a short amount of time in the same way, but it doesn't straight up kill them, and it's essentially the same thing. Or you can just put them back to a previous checkpoint, right? So if they, if they die, you can just hop them back like 10 seconds. Um, you can even do this in FPS and things like this. Like Call of Duty, it has checkpoints. It doesn't put you at the beginning of a level, it just puts you back a small time. But exceptions are round-based games. So if you're, if you're playing, like, there's Guns the Jewel, that game's amazing. I don't know if anyone's ever played that. But then Counter-Strike is the obvious one. If you play Counter-Strike, you're in a team of five versus five or, or whatever, like however many you have. And you, you should be punished for your mistakes because the rounds only last a very short amount of time. So it wouldn't make sense to let people recover their health, especially in a realistic game like this. And more exceptions are games with healers. Now, Team Fortress 2 already falls into the previous category, but up there is Chrono Trigger. So if you think about RPGs, it makes sense for your characters to have health because you have healers, right? So, so you already have an economy based on healing your characters and using healing items. Do you know what else sucks? Let me have some water. Depletion of ammo. This one's a bit, like, far-fetched. So if you've ever, I, I mean this very broadly, right? If you've ever played Zelda, that's my favorite game ever, Zelda Majora's Mask. But there's a big problem in the Zelda games sometimes, is that, say you're in a dungeon, and 
if you've played Zelda, you'll know sometimes you've got to solve puzzles, right? Some of them require arrows or bombs. If you suddenly realize, I have no arrows, sometimes there's no way to get arrows without going around smashing pots and things like that. So it's not, um, it's not rewarding you for solving the puzzles, it's rewarding you for running around doing stupid menial tasks. And then the best case scenario, this is Ratchet and Clank, and I've, I've barely actually played this game, but from what I did play, it seemed like there's basically limitless ammo boxes. You run around, there's ammo everywhere. So why even limit the, arrow, uh, the, the ammo in the first place? If you're just going to be walking around picking up ammo constantly, and it's not like a scarce resource, then why even pretend it's a scarce resource? And the worst case scenario, they have to leave a dungeon to go shopping. This is Twilight Princess. And in this game, there's a dungeon where you need bombs. I didn't know you'd need bombs for this dungeon. It's like half an hour to get to the dungeon. Then halfway through the dungeon, I realized I don't have enough bombs. I had to walk all the way out, go to a town, buy some bombs, and then go all the way back and redo all my progress. Well, what even is that? This just is not good game design. So how about just don't do it at all? If you think even Zelda has an arrow, right? You've got arrows, you can fire at people, but the hook shot is the same thing. It just has limited distance. So you can fire and then fire and then fire. You can fire infinitely. It, does, it hurts enemies in the same way. So if they already have an infinite arrow gun, then why do they need arrows? Or just balance your DPS. So you see here, this is the Spartan laser in Halo 3. Uh, or actually, I think that's Halo Reach, maybe. But the, the interesting thing about that gun, if you've ever played, is you charge it up, so it goes... So it takes a while to charge up. It makes a loud noise, and once you fire, it, it makes it supremely obvious where you are. So you can't just hide with it, because a giant laser goes across the sky, and then everyone else is going to turn and shoot that person. So you can make it a, a liability to carry your weapons. So if you make the player slow and visible with that overpowered weaponry, you can even make them appear on the radar if they have a sniper rifle or something like that. I mean, that's a weird example, but there was a game, Metroid Prime Hunters, that did that. There was a, there was a character with a sniper rifle, and uh, every... Like, if you stayed still too long, it would just broadcast your location to everyone. So there's notable exceptions. Team Fortress 2 is the main one, I think, because in Team Fortress 2, you have one team here and one team here, and you're both trying to push to the middle for, for supremacy, right? But the, the problem is, sometimes you run out of ammo. You can't just stand as a soldier and, or a heavy, especially the heavy weapons guy. You can't just go around, like, shooting everyone. You, you've got to sometimes run back to your base, and it encourages a way... Uh, you, you've got engineers who can give you ammo boxes and stuff. So it, it slows down the pace of the game and makes the game last longer and makes the game more fun. So it works in team games. And it, this, is, this is a common theme for a lot of this. Multiplayer game design is very different from single-player game design. So most FPS games also only let you have two guns, right? You can only juggle nowadays. I mean, Unreal Tournament, you can press all the keyboard buttons and bring out all your guns. But Halo, etc., you can only have two. So that's another way of stopping people from, from like, being too overpowered. So Halo could have had limited ammo, and it could have fixed the balance with like recoiling people for ages, or maybe you shoot and it lowers the shields, or like some like a big heavy gun, like a rocket launcher, slows you down so people can hit you easily. The, I don't think Halo. I think Halo could easily survive without ammo. In fact, this is arguably the worst part of Halo. In, in the main campaign, sometimes you reach a checkpoint and you have like five bullets left in your gun, and there's like ten ridiculously hard enemies. You've only got five bullets. Even if you headshot them, it takes three headshots to kill them. And then you've got to like, so you've pretty much got to run up, punch someone in the back, steal his gun. It, it, just, it just makes everything like obscenely difficult. They could have at least made the gun have infinite ammo, so you're not stuck in a stalemate where you have to punch your way out. So do you know what else sucks? If it ever loads, lives. Lives are there to make you pay more money. It's, it's all about money, that's it. Like, that's why lives are invented, right? Continues, the idea of a continue screen, it doesn't belong on a home console. Continues are there to, to make you put in another quarter. Otherwise, what's the point, right? There's, there's one mild exception to that, and that's Super Smash Brothers, because it halves your score. Like, so it, it does actually give you something, but the score is kind of pointless anyway. So virtual console is interesting by Nintendo 
because back in the day, a lot of NES games or NES games came from arcades. So they would punish you really severely. If you die in Mega Man, you go all the way back, right? And the Virtual Console removes perma game overs from badly designed NES games, and it lets you keep playing. And so does this. So if you, if you play Solomon's Key, for instance, that game is supremely difficult. But they just fixed it so that if you die, you just start the level again. Like they, do, they ignored the, they reprogrammed the game slightly to fix this problem. So alternatives to this, just make more content so you don't have to threaten your player with playing your game. It shouldn't be a threat. Like, you have to play my game again should not be a threat to the player. You should just make your game fun so they want to play the game in the first place. If you just use checkpoints everywhere, like this is VVVVV, you die a lot, but then you just go back immediately. So it still feels good and you still want to play, but you're not getting frustrated even though it's extremely difficult. Uh, don't steal my ideas, but this is like the premise of my game is that because when you die, your corpses stay behind. The game gets easier and easier, so anyone can beat it. Like, even someone who's never played a platformer before can beat it, even though, in principle, if the corpses were off, it's way harder than like Super Meat Boy. But the, the point is, well, the, the, there, there are exceptions to this as well, right? So you've got roguelikes. They embrace permanent death, right? The, the whole point about them is that if you die, uh, the game restarts. They're all based on random content. So you want to kill a player over and over again. The whole game is designed around the idea that you want to die, like you want your player to die. Because if they just played once, if, if Binding of Isaac, you played once, you defeated your mum, and then that's it, then the game wouldn't be very good. Uh, or Spelunky, you get to the end and you're done. You want people to die over and over again, so at that point it does make sense to do this. Right? Do you know what else sucks? Crafting. You don't need a crafting system. Stop it. No one's going to work that out. So it's, it's people hand me mobile games sometimes, like, play my game, Alex. And I'm like, OK, I'll try playing your game. And they're like, oh, and you can craft things. I'm like, I don't know your recipes. I don't know what any of these things are. I don't know how I'm supposed to assemble them. I didn't even know. In, the only reason I know in Minecraft is because like, it's just so everyone knows it at this point, everyone who's played. But the, the problem is, they just go to a wiki. So as soon as your, your, your game starts, instead of playing your game, they spend the first hour of it just reading on the internet. They open a tab in Steam and just, how do I craft things? So alternatives. Right, this is a weird alternative. If you think about it, shopping is quite similar. Right? You can just make them buy the things they want. It's not quite the same, but I'll get to that. Soul blades, I think, are a really interesting thing in RPGs. So how soul blades work, they're, they, they're in a few games. Your weapon starts with one attack. It's useless. But when you hit someone with it, and you kill them, it gains one attack. So if you kill 9,999 enemies, you have the ultimate sword in the game, right? But at the beginning, it starts weak. So it rewards you for using the sword, and it makes you stronger, but you didn't have to craft anything to do it. But I, I, I think a game that's terrible, no, it's not terrible, it's OK. But like Skyward Sword. They, they did something really good, actually, with this. They, they decided to experiment with the Zelda series, and they made a, a very good choice. And that's, you have your shield, right? And you can upgrade your shield. And it's like crafting, but you just go to an NPC to do it. So he tells you, hey, I want you to find some tumbleweed. And then you go to the desert, find some, and you can use that to upgrade. Right? Or just upgrade them through progression itself. So like Metroid, you never had to craft anything. You just get your new items. Like, and you, can even, you could even do some sort of like craft light menu where they don't know you need to have recipes. But if you think about it, if they just have to find one special item that upgrades their weapon, you could just make the item be the upgrade itself rather than the item they need to put into a craft window to upgrade. Uh, the exceptions are MMORPGs, again, multiplayer games, because these games allow players to fund an economy together and play as a group. So they're kind of like the NPC of your group in a way. You have your guild crafter, and they craft for you. And some people only craft, they don't even play the game. I mean, they do play the game, they're crafting. But they don't, they don't fight, they just sit at home in the game and craft, and in real life. So the, so the whole point is that, it makes sense in that, in that case because you, you've got other people to play with. 
you aren't going to make the next Minecraft. It's not going to happen. I don't want to like ruin your dreams, but I, I'm, I'm almost. A, I will put money that no one in this room is going to make the next Minecraft. I'm not even sure that is. I'm sure that. Well, I don't know if there's a next Minecraft. It was such a, a one-off thing. It's ridiculous. It's, it's impossible to know if we'll ever see this again. Do you know what else sucks? Skill trees. These are very similar, and these are often taught in universities as well. Just stick a skill tree on it. But it closes off end game content, right? So, so in some games, anyway, if, if I choose, like the first time I played Dragon Age, I noticed that if I choose this skill tree, I can never get this power that I want. So I, it, you end up having to choose small skill, minor skills that you don't even want to unlock major skills later. And sometimes the game even hides it from you. So you don't even know what the skills at the top are. You don't know what you want. So you either get punished later for, begin, for choices that you made badly in the beginning, or you have to spend the first half an hour reading wikis and skill descriptions. And on top of that, because you haven't even played the game yet, you might not even understand how important those skills are yet. So you'll be planning for something that you don't even know about yet. So it might completely ruin the game for you. And a lot of these are like 100 hour games, right? You're, you're forcing them to replay like a 100 hour game to, to get the skills they want. If you see, that's Morrowind, except it's totally not Morrowind because it's not brown enough. This is some kind of HD mod for it. Um, if you're forcing the, like, in Morrowind, they can upgrade all their skills to max, but they choose skills that matter to them, and those make them actually level up. But you can still be a master thief and a master mage and a master fighter. Like, it never closes off any of your options. You can do everything, but it doesn't make you choose at the beginning. Or just, yeah, just let them grind one character. Or you can auto-tree them. So this is uh, in some of the Final Fantasy games. Final Fantasy Tactics as well is an absolutely amazing game, and this does this. So how it works is you just take the decision out of their hands entirely. If someone uses lots of black magic, they become a black mage, and then they can, can become like an even more powerful sage version of that. Or if they use lots of black magic and lots of white magic, it lets them become a red mage, and they can use both types. So instead of, like, you, you just reward them on their play style, and then instead of making them have a really hard decision at the beginning, you take the decision away from them. But that isn't always a problem. Sometimes that's a useful thing, because you don't have to confuse them and frustrate them. You just take, and they can still plan it if they read the wiki, right? But you just give them skills based on what they prioritize and stuff. So exceptions to this, MMOs. Again, the, the eternal exception. You can't give everyone every ability in an MMO because it would completely break the game, right? You can't, you can't be a fighter and a mage, etc. You have to have limited skills, otherwise it's not a fun game. So, and another good thing, this is Catacomb Kids, which you might not have heard of, but you should play. It's super dope. It's in um, early access. I think it's still in early access, but it's, it's like a full fun game, Catacomb Kids, right? And this how this game works is, it's a bit like Spelunky, except it, it rolls you a character at the beginning, like a, a sort of RPG style character. You've got different, um, you've got some useful abilities and some negative abilities, and you can upgrade your character, right, with almost like a skill tree. Well, it is a skill tree, you just can't see it in the same way. But you choose abilities and then you can get the next ability on top of that. Etc. So, but because the game only lasts like, if you're me, it lasts one minute. If you're good at the game, I'm sure you could play for 20 minutes, like in one run. But because you restart pretty quickly, it doesn't really matter that they had to choose an option because they can just choose a different one next time. So the conclusion to this is, don't add features to your game that aren't fun at all, because it's pretty pointless, right? Think about your systems and design your game around your systems. If you don't need something, don't add it. You should, you should critically think about every feature you put in your game. Am I adding this because games have them, or am I adding it because it's fun and it adds content and it's useful? A skill tree, the skills add content. A skill tree does not add content. It literally just restricts the player. It removes content from the player. Just make better games and love each other. Yeah, rose out. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Uh, вопросы есть? 
Руки. О, отлично. Uh, hello, my name is Konstantin. I have hello. heard about a lot of things that really sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, okay, based on that, how would you characterize such a game as Dark Souls? Because it have a lot of things that you think that it really sucks. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, right, obviously, I, 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 throughout the talk I gave exceptions. There's always going to be exceptions to the rule and some games are going to are gonna work like that. But I do actually think there are some problems in Dark Souls. Like, sometimes, especially, I, I think they fixed it more recently in the new Dark Souls games and they have worked off these principles. But if you play Demon Souls, you, there'd be a boss, right? You'd get all the way there. And then if you die from some really stupid attack that you can't possibly know how they do it, then you've got, to re you've got to start all the way over again and fight everything again, and it takes ages. So it, it just, it's not really adding anything, it's just forcing... And, and young, like teenagers, etc., don't really mind that because they have all day to play games. But when you, especially when you go for an older market, people who are like working and they're professionals don't really have time a lot of the time to sit around like replaying the same stuff over and over again. So it, it kind of... I think the Dark Souls games have got better over time uh, at this problem, but I, I think they did initially have some of these problems. I, I, they've, they've got better in general. Don't you think that all these uh, difficulties are some kind of challenge and it makes players more and more again and again and again and again? Yeah, so I, I mean, like, so uh, I, I do that with my game. If you, if you try and beat the game without dying, it's ridiculously difficult. It's one of the hardest achievements on PlayStation right now. Um, and on top of that, I think trophies and achievements are a really good way, right? P gamers love trophies and achievements. They love getting the gamer score. They love getting a gold, a platinum trophy. I mean, I have loads of them. Like I, I spent my whole like teenage life just grinding trophies out. And a lot of the time, like in RPGs and stuff, I would just keep playing just to get the trophies. So for a lot of these hardcore players who want to finish all the content and want to play for prestige, there are other ways that you can encourage them to play a lot of your content without alienating the lower level players. Because ideally, you want to make a game that, that is really good for hardcore players, but is also accessible to anyone who wants to play. It's, 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 it's kind of sad when someone likes a game. I, I met a guy who, uh, he had a Meat Boy shirt. He was my friend's friend. And I was like, oh, you like Meat Boy? He's like, yeah, I love Meat Boy. I'm like, oh, did you, did you finish it? He's like, no, I got stuck in hell. And I'm like, that's World 4. This guy is walking around in a Meat Boy shirt, clearly likes the franchise, but he, his hands are physically not dexterous enough to finish that game, even though he loves it, right? So my game is essentially like Meat Boy, but at the same time, someone can, anyone can beat it, but like someone who's like, you, like your granddad or something probably... Well, he can beat it too, even if it, maybe your granddad's an amazing gamer, I don't know, I shouldn't be ageist, but like, the, it, it, you should be looking for that balance. I mean, you don't have to, you can just make a game that's crazy hard. Celeste just came out, and from what I understand, that just punishes everyone. But you, it, there's po it's possible to think about these players who you wouldn't otherwise get, while still concentrating on making the game fun for, hard, like, for really hardcore players. Thank you. NP. Oh, Hi. Hey. Uh, so you told that one of the way to uh, not get player upset if he lose uh, the game is to uh, reduce the difficulties. He, for example, dies. Mm. Yeah. Uh, does it work the opposite way? Like, if Make the player hard. does great, should you raise the difficulty? I mean, you can. Thanks. I mean, okay, so if you think about it, that's essentially what an endless runner is, right? You start off of a game that's super easy, you just jump over things, and by the end, there's all this crazy stuff happening on screen. So yeah, that definitely works as a difficulty curve. Like, you can, you can start, but, but to me in general, like, that happens in games anyway. Like, the last, like, World 8-4 of Super Mario Bros. Is, is significantly harder than World 1-1. So you're, just by progressing through the game, it's already getting harder. But if you're talking about the game auto-balancing on the fly, you could do that, but... Uh, 
uh, well, you could just like throw things at them. <laughs> like there's a there's there's actually in my game there's a Twitch mode and they can vote on mean things. So if you play with Twitch mode on, people will make the game harder for you. So that's essentially like the same thing. But if you the, the, they can vote and they can vote in effects that make the game easier for you. So if you're doing too well, if you're doing really badly, they'll your Twitch stream might help you. And if you're doing really well, they'll try and screw you. But the but that's just like Twitch. You, I mean, you could easily just make it like t sense how quickly they're getting through a level, how easily they're dying, and start making the game more difficult. But I'm not sure that there's actually much point. Like, it, for the effort you'd have to do to program that, you could just make more levels that are even harder. So I don't I like. I don't. I'm not necessarily going to dismiss it as an idea. You could do that. It might be really cool. But also, like traditional game design already has that built in. So I don't think it's necessary as such. Hi, Alex. Hey. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, hey. I'd like to ask you about uh, first-person shooters. Okay. So basically, when they were invented in Half-Life, yeah, mm -hmm. we had a um, uh, health bar, yeah, actually, health, health points. Yeah. And uh, with progression of shooters, uh, this it was removed, actually, mm -hmm. as you were suggesting. But after that, uh, we have uh, Wolfenstein, where they uh, like came back to the original decision and many people liked it mm. uh, me too actually because mm. it gives me more more control more feedback or feeling of mm. of I, responsibility I over my character mm. yeah i haven't played wolf the new wolfenstein do do you are there health boxes yeah of course uh, and there's checkpoints are there checkpoints in the game? No, no, no. You you have uh, health health boxes. You can pick up. Uh, so the levels are just like really long, and then you you give them health boxes. Yeah, well. yeah. I think as long as you're giving them ample health boxes, it's it's like quite similar to the recharging health, except instead of hiding behind a pillar. So it's more about rationed. not punishing. Yeah, just player. like as as long as as long as it's fairly balanced, right? But the the I think the good thing about recharging health is it. It doesn't have a fixed skill level. So if you think about it, uh, health boxes, unless you, what you could do is like, do you know Left 4 Dead? It gives, you, it gives you health sometimes when you need it. Like it has the AI director that's smart and figures it out. That's a, that's a really good design decision. But if you think about it in other games that there's like, there's one health box here and there's one health box here. If, if you're really good, then you could beat the whole level without the health boxes. If you're really bad, maybe even with the health boxes, you still can't beat the level. So it just kind of makes it so, hey, the average player has a good time, but these people don't, and it's too easy for these people. Whereas if you make, like, the good thing about recharging, and I know it's not like, you don't need it, I'm not saying you need it ubiquitously through every game, but one good thing about it is, even, even if you're really good at the game, it, like you can still use it, and if you're bad, you can use it even more often. Um, what, one example to this is like, as I suppose Wolfenstein, you can play easy mode, you can play medium mode, and stuff like that. So you, people would just go on the easier difficulty, but you don't really need that on a game where you've got recharging health. Like, but but if you if you look at like Halo or something like that, if you it, it kind of has the same thing, right? If you if you're playing on the easiest mode, then you're like a god. You just run through. You don't recharge ever. But that's kind of how like a bad player sees all games. Whereas like legendary, if you play on legendary, then then you're gonna have to use recharging like all the time, even if you're a good player. But it allows worse players to beat it eventually, as long as they have the willpower. As long as they, I, f I feel like if someone wants to beat a game, you should let them beat the game, right? <laughs> but I, at the same time, I don't feel like like sometimes it's a bit overkill. Like Mario, like they'll make it if you die a lot. There's a good assist mode on the Nintendo Switch that's doing good things, like it makes a good mode for kids where it kind of helps them and corrects them. But like back in the day, they kind of took the piss a bit with like, um, uh, if you died like 10 times, they make you invincible. And it's like, it's, that's not, it's not helping them get better at the game. And it's not really fun. It, it feels like a crutch and it makes you feel bad that you, that you, ha you died so many times. But there's, there's, I think there's better ways of doing it and, and letting people win, even if they're not that great. Thanks. Еще вопросы? О, целых два. Вы не ленитесь, вот такая штука тут есть. 
Hi, Alex. Hey. Um, I want to ask about crafting system. Uh, you said that it's not um, that it sucks, yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, there is a lot of games which build their community based on crafting, like yeah. Terraria, like Minecraft, Dragon Quest Builders, and, mm. and such. so. The the thing is about like Terraria, Minecraft, uh, and and Starbound, right? They um, they got there early, and they were like the first people. There's not really a market for it that that very easily anymore. Like I'm I'm sure like some of you might be able to squeeze in, but it's such a saturated market, and a lot of people just don't do it in a fun way. Um, I think I, I do think crafting has a place in multiplayer games, right? So if you if you're playing a game where you're playing with each other, it really does make sense to have a crafting system. A, lo a lot of this talk doesn't make any sense whatsoever if you're making multiplayer games. But in, in single player games, um, the, the, thing, the reason Terraria and Minecraft are interesting, right, is their procedural worlds, right? There's, there's not even really, like, the gameplay is very unconventional. You don't have necessarily, I know in, in Terraria there's bosses, but you don't really have a specific task. It's just like, hey, play and play until you're bored. So like, you, you might be like, oh, I'm gonna go to the netherworld. That's like the whole point of, that's my personal quest. And then you just have to get there. So because, because um, it isn't really obvious like what's, um, there isn't one clear goal. People can do what, maybe someone just wants to build a house. Maybe someone wants to build a mansion. It, you can't, um, it would not make sense to structure the game in a way that doesn't give them much freedom. Like, you, they need a lot of freedom to be able to do their crazy stuff, right? But, like, a lot of single player game design, like, doesn't need that stuff. There is a point to it. You're going somewhere. I, if, if you want to make a game like that, that's procedural and stuff like that, you can, but on your own head be it, because the. <laughs> There's lots of games doing that, and there's lots of big studios funded by people with millions of pounds who are trying to crack, like the Chinese market and stuff like that. There was, um, if you ever played Dizzy, um, it's a game by the Oliver Twins. Uh, they they then they had a company called Blitz that went under, and then they made a co they made a company called Radiant Worlds, and their idea was like we're going to make this game. Um, I think it's Skylanders, maybe not. But there's, they, they made a game where they decided to make a game where um, they, they got like hundred, they got like millions or hundreds of thousands at least in investment, and they're like, we are going to make this game that's a crafting system and it's this, 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 and they tried to make Minecraft but better, and because China had never got really hit by Minecraft yet, and they thought they could cash in on it, and they went bankrupt last year. So like, even people with like millions of pounds are failing at this. Um, whereas if you threw millions of pounds into like a car game, you'd probably make your money back, right? So uh, the, there, there are economic realities to games. Like, feel free to follow your dreams, but at the end of the day, you've got to pay your rent. Uh, I remain highly dubious that anyone's going to pay rent with a Minecraft-like game anytime soon. But feel free to try. <laughs> uh. Hi, my name is Dmitry and I have a question. I don't know if you have played uh, Nier Automata before, but there is a uh, really interesting uh, uh, difficulty mechanics when they turn off some gameplay mechanics uh, to provide uh, ability to more wide a range of uh, people play the game and uh, as, as from my experience I have seen such persons that haven't played any games before and just started playing this game and uh, it provides a lot of uh, helping uh, assistance mm. systems that uh, help you to go through the game. Mm. Do, do you think it's a Wait, what's idea? this game called? Uh, Nero Automata. Oh, Nero. All right. I've, I've still not played it, but I know that I have to. Right? I've been told. Right, what, what, what was the question? Yes, yeah, the, the question, do you think uh, if uh, th there is a set of game, game mechanics that you could turn off to provide more accessibility to a wider, range, uh, wider audience, is a good idea or not? I mean, do, like... Do, do, do you really necessarily uh, add uh, another mechanics to... Uh, to please more hardcore so games. A, a lot of games Gamers. have this, like, a, like they have like boss rush modes or whatever. They have like a mode where you finish the game and now, hey, you can play again, but it's crazy and it's insane and there's loads of extra things. I, I think that's like a good idea. It works quite well. It just like, does it fit your game? Does it make your game better? 
a, a lot of this stuff is quite easy to add to games as well. Like, it's not difficult to throw things that you've already programmed into earlier parts of the game. Like, Meat Boy had an entire dark world where they kind of just flipped the sprites and made it a bit harder. And they can, like, double the content for, like, a small amount of work, relatively. So the, there are a lot of modes like this where you can just throw extra things into the game to make it better at low cost. And, yeah, go for it. Like, it's a, it's a good way to make content. Yeah, thank you, Alex.